Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. I want to take just a minute to welcome each individual here, our members. It's so good to see those that are here. We do have some that are not with us due to sickness, some who are traveling. Pray that they will return back safely to us as soon as possible, but also those who are visiting. We do have visitors. I have already met a few, and I see some that I have not met, but um, we have several visitors. So I want to let you know that you are welcome this morning and hope that you feel welcome and that you are always welcome here at Fayetteville Church of Christ. I want to take a minute to welcome also those who are watching online. Every week we have a number of those who cannot make it here physically, and so they watch online. Welcome to those as well. Take a minute to do a couple of things for me. If you will fill out our members and especially our visitors an attendance card on the back of the pew in front of you, if you'll fill it out and those who are visiting, you can drop it in the collection plate as it passes. And that way we can have a record of your attendance. Another thing that I would ask for you to do is to silence your cell phone. I know that as we approach God before his throne, little things can be a distraction to others around us, little noises. And we can prevent that and perhaps go about 60 minutes without it. And so if you could silence it or turn it off, we would appreciate that. As we begin this morning... I know that some like to follow along on the uh, hard copy, so if you want to follow along in the song book, our first song will be 531. 531. Stan Mitchell will be our song leader this morning. Also, if you want to follow along in your own copy of the Word of God, it will also be on the projectors behind me, the screens. But if you want to follow along in your own written copy, And also leave it open as you follow along through the sermon. It'll be a great outline and tool to use through the sermon. The text or the uh, reading this morning will be Philippians 1, 1 through 7. Philippians 1 and Randall Bell will read that as we begin. Philippians 1, 1 through 7. I want to make something else known to our members who maybe don't use this resource, but even to our visitors, if you're visiting with us, we do have some things to help you grow in your knowledge and to help you through the sermon. We have a a member here, one of our deacons, who puts together kids' notes uh, for our young kids to follow along and to take notes, but he also has what he calls big kids' notes, and it's basically an outline of the sermon where you can take notes and hopefully you can You can take these notes and you can follow along through the sermon and it will help you in a tremendous way. And so if you don't take advantage of that, I want to encourage you to do so. It's a great way to follow along as uh, the sermon is being presented. They are out where the bulletins usually are. Grab one of those either this week or next week and it'll be a great way to to, to grow through the, the sermons. Also, Stan wanted me to announce that for the young kids' notes, for um, those that usually do the kids' notes, there's a special assignment on it this week. And he wanted me to encourage you to look at that special assignment and to do it. All right? You'll see it there on the kids' notes. You'll know what it is. We do have some to remember in our prayers as we begin. Two in the bulletin, Larry Fields is waiting for test results, and Gail Chapman will also have another surgery. We pray for good results for those, but many others who are sick and cannot be with us. We'll have other announcements for events at the close of our worship, but as we begin this morning, Randall will read us uh, in the Word of God. morning. Today I will be reading from Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 through 7. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And it reads, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy, 
for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think of this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Number 531. As you're able, let's stand together as we sing this song. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the height. Sun and moon rejoice before him. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Hallelujah, amen. morning, number 157, 157. Oh, 
all bow in prayer as we go to our Heavenly Father. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we approach thy throne of grace this morning with thankful hearts, Father, that we are able to come to thee in prayer, thanking thee, Father, for all the many blessings that you've blessed us with and for this lovely family of Christians that meets here at this place. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless us as you see our needs, but Father, especially we ask thee to Give each one of us the zeal to do the things that we should as Christians so that we can better to strengthen our own selves as well as to make the congregation grow. Father, we're mindful of those of our number who are bedridden and sick or shut-ins, and we pray, Father, that you'll bless them with whatever blessings that you possibly can so that they can be comfortable in, in the situation. But Father, there are also those of our number who have lost loved ones, and we pray that you would be with them and, and give them comfort. But Father, also we understand that this nation, this nation is in peace right now, but we, Father, we pray our blessings upon, your blessings upon the government that they might be able to make the proper decisions to keep us and peace, and peace throughout the world. Now, Father, as we go further into this service, we pray that you'll be with us as we assemble around the Lord's table to commune to the sacrifice that was made for our sins. And we're so thankful for this sacrifice, Father, that we pray that as we partake of these emblems that we'll do so in a manner well-pleasing to thee. Now, Father, we ask thee to go with us as we go through this service. Bless Dave as he presents a lesson this morning. Help us, Father, to take these lessons and apply them to our lives that we might become stronger Christians in thy sight. These blessings and prayers we ask in Christ's name. Amen. To help us focus our minds on the Lord's Supper, let's sing number 444, 444. We'll sing the first and third stanzas. There was one who was willing to tie in my stead that a soul so unworthy might live.
symbols in the Bible, and many of them we're very familiar with because we're taught as young children, taught as young Christians, preached to and preached about in, the, in our classes and in our, in our pulpits. You know, we understand the symbol of Christ's blood, that that was shed and needed to be shed for us as a sacrifice, but also that it cleanses our sins away, washes our sins away. We also understand Christ's body as being a sacrifice on the cross, the same as the lamb or the, or the goat uh, was sacrificed on the altar for the sins and the old law. But also that he talks about the, we also see it as the bread, his body being the bread of life, uh, the, the God's word by his action on earth. I'd like to read uh, out, of, out of John chapter 6. Something that uh, Jesus is talking to, specifically, he's actually telling the Pharisees, and it's not, and it's before the Lord's Supper, but he's talking about these same symbols that are represented by, about what, by what we're about to do. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. We eat what symbolizes his body and blood now to remember the sacrifice on the cross for us. But Jesus also, in just what he just told the Jews or what I just read, is that we need to partake of, of God all the time. And that is the bread of life. You know, as we live for and live because of the word of God. And we need to remember that just taking, because sometimes we just take this and say, okay, I'm done. And that is not what this is about. This is, remember, the sacrifice that he gave for us so that we're motivated to go out and live like he did when we walk out those doors. Will the men come forward, please? <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son on the cross for our sins. We remember that as we take this bread that represents your body. And we offer this prayer in your son's name. Amen.
pray again. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you for that blood that was shed on that cross to, to cleanse our sins away. We, were, we will remember that as we take this cup, and that this is the Christ's blood that saves, takes away our, our sins and makes us white as snow. We offer this prayer in your son's name, for be your will. Amen. Now as we're set to, uh, to give, to, to give a collection, I want to read what Paul said about the, in Corinthians, what he said about the uh, Macedonian church congregation. And let's think about this not just as we give right now, but just as we are, as giving people of our time and ourselves uh, through our week. And of of course, Paul is referring to the Macedonians in the scripture uh, of their attitude wanting to give money to go to the Jerusalem church, was, which was in, in, in poverty at the time. He says, moreover, brethren, referring to the Corinthians, talking to the Corinthians, he says, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their generosity. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with great urgency, or with much urgency, that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And the sense the Macedonians demanded that they be part of it, even though they were considered poor, or at least by Paul, that they did not have the ability. Let that always be uh, our case, that we're always willing and want to be giving and asking for the opportunity to do so outside of just giving money, but giving of ourselves and our time to each other and to those neighbors who don't even know Jesus. Let's pray. 
Dear Lord, please bless us in our giving. Use us to further your kingdom. And we offer this prayer in your son's name, if it be your will. Amen. If you would like to mark the song of encouragement following our lesson this morning, that will be number 771, 771. And now before our message, number 700, as you're able, let's stand again and sing this song. Number 700. To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master has trod. With the palm of his counsel, our strength to renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do. Toiling hard, toiling hard. remiss in our Bible class this morning in not thanking publicly Brother Wayne Nash for teaching this class, uh, the Sunday morning class last week in my absence. I just want to correct that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Wayne taught on short notice and I appreciate that very much. Be here tonight. I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm thankful for your presence. Be here tonight. Brother Ron Brown will be speaking for us this evening, telling us a little bit about his work in Southeast Asia. I want you to know that the emphasis of our sermon this morning is going to be very definitely and very deliberately on us, the congregation here. Now, for several months, the elders of this congregation have been talking about the possibility of and actually uh, talking to several of our brothers about serving as deacons in this congregation. And about three weeks ago, they put forward five names 
of men in the congregation in whom they have confidence. And the objective of our sermon this morning is to refresh our memories a little bit with a good, clear overview of the identity and the biblical concept of deacons, what some of their specific responsibilities might be, and some misconceptions and some common errors with respect to the subject. Now, I'm not, this morning, going to concentrate our attention in 1 Timothy chapter 3 on the qualifications of deacons, and I'm not going to simply because I believe that the congregational family here is well-versed in what verses 8 through 11 of 1 Timothy chapter 3 actually say in this regard. Not all men in the congregation are qualified to be deacons. Not all men in the congregation are able to be deacons. It may even be that there are some brothers in the congregation who are not willing, and that's, that's fine. The goal this morning is really very simple, and that's to lay some, some groundwork as we consider the changes that growth is bringing about within the congregation here. Deacons have a very specific place among the people of God. And it's important for us as the congregation of God's people here to understand what the Bible says about deacons, about their work, about their responsibilities, in order to have men who serve as God wants them to. So let me first begin by pointing out that there is a very clear, distinct definition associated with the word deacon in the New Testament. And that is our standard, that is our basis, and that's where we want to concentrate our attention. The word deacon comes from a Greek word. Many of you know this. It comes from the word diakonos, which means servant. Deacons, by definition, are servants. A form of that Greek word appears 29 times in the 27 books of the New Testament. It's usually translated by the word minister or servant, but five times in most English translations, it's rendered as deacon. It shows a specific responsibility within the congregation when it's used that way. The basic meaning of that Greek word, though, diakonos, is one who carries out the commands of another. That's what the root meaning is. And it comes from a word that means, basically, to run errands. To run errands for somebody. That's the, the background of the word in the Greek language. So it has a very distinct definition. Notice that deacons are workers in the congregation. That's the biblical concept. They're workers. When the New Testament translators 500 years ago coined the English word deacon, prior to that, it wasn't known. But as the Greek New Testament was being translated into English, they transliterated this Greek word, diakonos, and made up a new English word, deacon. And they did it to describe men with specific designated responsibilities in the local congregation. Now it's clear that there is a distinction between these men and others from the passage that Randall read a moment ago. If you look back to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, deacons are noted separately from the congregation, as are the elders or bishops, the pastors, the overseers. They're set out as being specific individuals. It's also plain in the qualifications text of 1 Timothy chapter 3 from verses 8 through 11. You have some very specific qualifications, some very specific requirements that are laid out for men to serve as deacons. Now, if you turn to Acts chapter 6, You'll notice there that the seven men who served the Jerusalem church are never actually called with this word in the New Testament. They're never actually called deacons, but it's plain that they did the basic work of deacons in the Jerusalem church. They fulfilled a specific defined need so that the apostles could concentrate on their responsibility of teaching. 
Let's just make this simple observation. A brother in Christ who's not willing to work has no business being a deacon because the essence of being a deacon is a willingness to serve, a willingness to work. Now let us, let's note number three as we talk about this. We have a specific definition. That specific definition includes the idea of service, of working. But number three, there first ought to be a need in the congregation for deacons before there are deacons in the congregation. Now we're blessed here. We currently have four pastors, four elders. We have nine servants, nine deacons so far. There is no need to appoint more deacons if there's nothing for them to do. But look at the example of Acts chapter 6. And again, I recognize in chapter 6, verses 1, 2, and 3, these men are not described with that word, but the work they do is very clear. There was a benevolent work that needed attention. Now, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, growing, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Now, what you've got here are some Jewish Jews, some Judea Jews, and some outside of Judea Jews that are in Judea, all of whom have become Christians. Some of them are home folks and some of them are not. And the folks that are not home folks that didn't grow up there, they have a little bit of a problem because the folks that grew up there are being treated preferentially in the daily ministration, the daily distribution for the widows. And you go on there in chapter 6, and what happens? It comes to the attention of the apostles. And the apostles give this instruction to the church. You seek out amongst yourselves. You look out amongst yourselves. Now, think about this. How many Christians were there in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 6? You go back to chapter 2 and you've got 3,000 plus just on the day of Pentecost. And the church is mushrooming rapidly from that point. By the time we get to ch chapter 6, we have thousands of Christians not all of whom are from Jerusalem in the immediate area around. Some of them are for long ways off. You go back to the early part of chapter 2, and we have uh, over a dozen different countries and languages mentioned where these folks had come from. Some of them are still there. So he says in verse 3, Luke records for us, here's the instruction. Seek out, brethren, from among you seven men who have good reputation, who are full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom that we may appoint over this business. You see, there was a need, a benevolent work in the church needed attention among the saints in Jerusalem. The selection of these men can serve as a basic guideline for us. A need was identified and the need was addressed. There's the basic guideline. They didn't say, hey, we've got all of these good qualified men, let's find something for them to do. They said, no, here's a job that needs to be done. Let's find some men to take care of it. The apostles did not instruct the church to select men simply because they were there. Many congregations make the mistake of selecting deacons for faulty reasons, for non-scriptural reasons. Some will say, well, you know, it, it'll, it'll be a good training ground for future elders. You know what? That might, on a practical level, be very true. The skills that these men bring to serving as deacons might serve them very well as elders. But training is not the point of being a deacon. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10, they're supposed to be tested before they become deacons. Others will say, well, you know, it'll, it'll get these, these men to attend services more consistently. I've been in congregations like that, and you know what? It doesn't work that way. If they're not participating, if they're not involved before they become deacons, they're not going to be afterwards. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, in the parable of the talents, when does the Lord 
commend the faithful servants. It's after they've been proven. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. See, after he'd been tested, then he was rewarded. After he'd been tested, then he was commended. After he was tested, then, then he was approved. Sometimes, though, folks will say, well, this young man now has two children, so it's time to make him a deacon. I've been in congregations where that happens, too. But, you know, that's only one of the requirements given in 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's not the only one. In the New Testament, when we go back to the biblical example, what we find is that deacons were selected because there was a specific need. Because there was a need that required the attention of capable men. It was not simply so that the congregation could say, Woohoo, we have deacons. When we think about selecting some of our own brothers to serve as deacons, it ought to be done with specific needs in mind. And Tom and Greg and Jim and Jim have talked about this and discussed this carefully, thoughtfully. They have identified some specific needs within the congregation here that these men could conceivably address. So let's notice number four. You have a specific definition and then you have a specific work and a need. Number four, what are some of the things deacons can do? Just to remind ourselves. We've already pointed out they're servants within the congregation, so any work of the church that they can fulfill might be suitable for their talents. Think about the example, go back again to Acts chapter 6 to those men that serve the congregation there and look at the relationship between elders and deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3. You notice in Acts chapter 6 and verse 3, seven men were selected to serve primarily to minister to the physical needs of the widows in the church so that the apostles could concentrate on spiritual things, teaching. You go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and look at verse 10, and it becomes clear that deacons function, they work in their areas of responsibility under the guidance of the elders. There is no board of deacons in the Lord's church. There is no diaconate separate from the guidance and the oversight of the elders. These men are not a junior body of leadership in the church. This is not the House of Representatives to the Elders' Senate or something of that arrangement. Let these be tested and then let them be, serve as deacons being found blameless. What could deacons do? Well, let's just think about some examples. Just just for a moment. They may deal with the benevolent needs of the church. Hardly a week goes by, sometimes at some, some times of the month, hardly a day goes by that there's not some request for assistance or aid from the church, either within the community or within the congregation. Now, brethren, we're blessed to live in a very convenient, commodious, affluent community. And so those needs are not what they would be in other places. But when they're legitimate, they're legitimate and they need to be addressed. Dealing with those things is one of the responsibilities that a deacon could fulfill. Handling, for example, the day-to-day -day, uh, affairs of the congregation on a financial level, paying the light bill, things like that. Now we have a a good administrative assistant, our, our, our good sister Susie, that takes care of a lot of this on a day-by-day -day basis and does a fine job as our congregational secretary. But there are other aspects of this that one of these brothers might need to fulfill. And we do have one of our brothers that, that oversees all of this and does a fine job of it, one of our deacons. Maybe it's maintaining this physical facility. Brethren, we're blessed with a very comfortable location to meet. It takes upkeep, it takes 
oversight. It takes responsibility. And some of our brothers do a great job in that respect. Others handle the details of our Bible class programs, both on the, on the uh, adolescent and the adult levels, planning the activities of the, the fellowship activities of the congregation, both materially and spiritually, tending to the, the needs of our missionaries and, and those who work in overseas works and other places, handling the, the details of uh, relieving needs within the church and visiting and so forth, making assignments, making sure that there's someone here to, to lead the singing and to lead the prayers and to serve at the table and so forth. All of these are things that deacons can and do fulfill. Those are just examples. The list could go on. Let's just note this. Some of these responsibilities, some of these jobs or prospects are more difficult or more involved than others. Some of them require more specific skills or knowledge or wisdom or in some cases discretion than others do. Some of these jobs might require more authority and more responsibility than others, but that doesn't make any of them unimportant. Regardless of the particular responsibility that a man fulfills, the point is that the work is important to the well-being of the congregation. Now I do want to take just a moment and just touch what we might call some misconceptions, some mistakes that sometimes are made with respect to deacons. We've already touched one, and that is this idea that, well, deacons help lead the church. And that may be the most common misconception folks have about men serving as deacons. Deacons are not junior elders. It's wrong to expect that a man is eventually going to be an elder simply because he's been a deacon. This is not like uh, a corporate structure where you advance just because you've been there so long. Expecting a, a promotion to the eldership is not a reason to serve as, as a deacon. Deacons can never act as, in a political sense, as the loyal opposition to the eldership, waiting for their turn in power. That's not, there, there is not supposed to be any kind of political structure within the Lord's church other than the king at the head. His word is our law. If we do this otherwise, that will destroy the congregation. But there are other misunderstandings that sometimes occur that we guard against. And I'll tell you, I think our elders do a good job, in my own opinion. I think our elders do a good job of trying to guard against these things. That is, giving a man responsibility without authority. And that may be the most common frustration among deacons. That is, being held accountable for, for getting something done, for taking care of some legitimate need, without being given the basic resources or authority to accomplish the goal. Many years ago, I knew a brother who served as a deacon in a congregation that was given the responsibility of taking care of the physical facilities and the doors to the auditorium, the doors to the building were old and began to deteriorate. There were old wooden doors and they'd been painted innumerable times. And so uh, as the weather kept, the wind and the water kept blowing in and they just deteriorated, Finally, he just called the local glass company and said, we need to put some good aluminum glass doors in here and just solve this problem. They came, they did, and then he was told that he had exceeded his authority because he had spent too much money on that without uh, clearing it with the elders first, but they had given him responsibility for the building. Take care of it, fix these doors. He did what they told him to do. Responsibility without authority will render a man helpless. Let me go back and touch something else that, that I mentioned a moment ago. This idea of make them deacons and they'll come. Field of dreams aspect of this. It's folly to select and appoint a man to a position of responsibility in the hopes that it will get him to be faithful. If he's not faithful now, if he's not participating now, 
putting him in a position of responsibility is not going to change that. But it will bring shame on the church and the community because the community knows how such men live. Here's the point, brethren. This is an important subject. It's not one to be hurried, and I want to commend publicly our elders for having taken time and and looked carefully, thought carefully, discussed among themselves and with the men involved and within the congregation as well. They've taken time to make sure that a, a clear understanding and deliberation has been the path that we have taken, not haste and folly. Don't forget the basic biblical concept of deacons. They're servants. All Christians are servants in one sense, and we all need to be faithful ones. But we go back and look at this, and it's clear that these need to be men who are known for their faithfulness. Now, if you take your Bible and you turn to Romans chapter 6, and you look at verses 17 and 18, You see there that Paul emphasizes that in Christ, all Christians are servants. We're servants of whom we choose to serve. If we choose to serve the world, we're servants unto death. If we choose to serve the Christ, we're servants unto life, life everlasting. We get to make the choice. We get to surrender to whomever we choose whether to God in Christ or to passion in the world. Let me ask you a simple question. As you examine yourself, we're talking about service. We're talking about responsibility. We're talking about men who serve in a way so as to aid and bless and benefit the church in the direction of eternity. But I want you to draw back from that and look simply at yourself for a moment and answer this simple question. Do you need to surrender yourself as a servant to Jesus Christ this morning? Do you need to answer the Lord's invitation? Not necessarily in this moment to serve as a deacon in the church, but simply to serve as a Christian. Are you one who has already taken those first steps in faith that bring you into fellowship with Christ? Are you a Christian who needs to be renewed in your zeal, who needs to repent of sins, who needs to ask forgiveness of sins, who needs to ask brothers and sisters to join you at the throne of God in prayer? If you are, the invitation is for you. If you have not yet become a Christian, if you have not yet taken the first steps in faith, you have not yet repented of your sins, then you need to do that. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the living Son of God, it's time. If you need to make the good confession of faith that you do believe that Jesus Christ is the living Son of the living God, it's time. If you need to be baptized into Christ so that your sins can be washed away, the Lord can write your name in His book of life so that angels in heaven And Christians on earth will rejoice at the birth of a new child in Christ. It's time. The gospel invitation is yours now. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing a song of encouragement for you. If you have need, then we urge you, come now. of your Savior and Lord, Jesus will give you rest. Oh, happy rest, sweet happy rest, Jesus will give you rest. Oh, why won't you come in simple trusting faith, Jesus will give you rest. Will you come, will you come? There is mercy for you, mom, for your aching breast. On 
only come as you Jesus will give you rest. Oh, why won't you come in simple trusting faith? Jesus will give you rest. Be seated, please. It's a good day on a variety of levels. Kendall Lee wants to be baptized into Christ. What a privilege, what a joy it is when Christian parents and grandparents get to become not just mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, but brother and sister with their children. Kendall Garner wants to be baptized into Christ. Jim, her granddad, is going to ask her the most important question of her life. And based on that response, Jimmy, her dad, is going to help her enter into the kingdom of God. As preparations are made for Kendall's baptism, let's sing number 85. Number 85. You will need your book for this after this announcement. It is a time to rejoice, and whenever we have a person who makes this decision to become part of the body of Christ, we think it's always appropriate to remind ourselves, those of us who already are members of that body, the church, of the significance of this moment. You know, in John chapter 3, the chapter where most people know one verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Many people don't realize that in that very same chapter, just a few verses earlier, in a conversation with a man named Nicodemus, Jesus told him that most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This being born again is part of the belief, those who believe shall not perish, those who believe in him. Nicodemus didn't understand how you can be born again. He said, can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, unless one is born of water and the spirit, one cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We celebrate today a birthday, a spiritual birthday, because of the obedience that our soon-to-be sister, Kendall, has decided. You know, Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, talks about how baptism, just as Noah was saved by water, he likens that to how we are saved by water today, not simply going under the water or taking a bath or putting away the filth of the flesh, as he puts it, but the answer of a good conscience. Our conscience becomes good. We answer our conscience when we do something that we know we ought to do. We ought to be baptized if we believe that God gave his only begotten son so that those who believe in him will not perish. We want to do the things that he instructed us to do. And he instructs people to be born again, and that's what's about to take place. Paul describes baptism in Romans chapter 6 
as being buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Baptism, we know, represents the gospel itself, the story of Jesus and what he did. He lived, he, he died, he was buried, but he rose again, just as we're buried. Our sister, soon-to-be sister Kendall, is about to be buried in water to be raised again. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. So this is the celebration, this is the birthday that we celebrate. The beginning of a new life. Number 85 in your book. We will sing the fourth stanza immediately after Kendall has been baptized. Buried with Christ, my blessed Redeemer, dead to the old life of folly and sin, Satan may call, the world may entreat me, there is no voice that answers within, dead to the world, to voices that call me, living anew, obedient but free, dead to the choice that once did enthrall me, yet is not I, Christ liveth in me. Dead unto sin, a life through the Spirit, risen with him from the gloom of the grave. All things are new, and I am rejoicing in his great love, his power to save. Dead to the world, to voices that call me, living on new obedient but free, that to the choice that once did enthrall me, yet is not I, Christ liveth in me. See if I can do this without making a lot of noise. We've been talking about deacons this morning. 
As I mentioned about three weeks ago, our bishops, our pastors brought five names of men in the congregation before us as prospective deacons to serve with those nine men who are currently serving in that capacity. This was not done lightly. It was not done hastily. It was done with careful thought and deliberation. These are not the only men that that were considered. These are not the only men who could serve. But in looking at the needs of the congregation and the particular responsibilities that need to be addressed, the elders brought you as the congregation these men's names as seeming to be the best men for the jobs at hand. So I want to ask our elders, Greg and Tom and Jim and Jim, to come forward to the front of the auditorium. These are the men who bear the responsibility of overseeing the congregation here. These are the bishops, the pastors of the church, the spiritual leadership. The names that these brothers have put before us as the members of the church, as you well know, are Dale Finley, Eric Hagen, Keith Killingsworth, David Riley, and Rick Sharp. And I'd like to ask those five brothers to come forward now as well and to stand before the congregation. The responsibilities that the elders have proposed for these men to handle are for Dale to coordinate our worship assemblies, for Eric to work along with Tom Durden, one of our pastors, David Gulledge, one of our ministers, on our young people's spiritual education, for Keith to oversee the security of our facilities. You know, in this time of of changing society, what once was never a thought or a consideration is now of paramount importance in many respects, and that's the security of the facility while we're here. And so the elders have suggested that Keith might be well suited for that responsibility. David Riley, who has already been working with us in our adult education program, and Rick Sharp, who for the last four years has overseen the work of our Georgia School of Preaching campus here in Fayetteville. Brothers, elders, as I understand it, you have you found these brothers to be both scripturally qualified and, and willing to serve the Fayetteville congregation in this capacity, serving under your oversight. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. In that respect, then we'll ask Brother Jim Garner to speak on behalf of the elders. And these men will then join as deacons of the congregation here, Dennis Graham and David Hopkins, Hugh Kelly and Jerry Kendricks, Andy Johnson, Stan Mitchell, David Poscovich, Anthony Ravenel, and Jack Sorrell as deacons of the Fayetteville congregation. Let me encourage you to support them, to encourage them, to commend them in every good work. Brother David Riley, Brother Eric Hagen, Brother Keith Killingsworth, Brother Rick Sharp, and Brother Dale Finley. It is our joy to welcome you into the job that you have agreed to, to perform before your brothers and sisters in Christ, and to continue to be the example that you have set forth. May God bless you in your work in his kingdom. Brother Durden. Would you live in a prayer for these brethren? Let us pray together. Our God, our Father, we are so thankful this morning to come and worship you in spirit and truth. To see this, our new sister, be buried in baptism. And for this opportunity to have these five men work in this capacity. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as was instructed in 
Acts chapter 6 from the early church. We've done this in a manner that is acceptable, having looked over the qualifications and that we find in, in Timothy, understanding that these men that stand before us are qualified. They have committed to do the work that you've given them to do. Help us as a congregation to stand beside them, to support them as they carry out those duties. Most of all, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be your children and your servants. We pray that we would all live a life that would be acceptable to you so that when this life is over, because of the sacrifice that you've made through your Son, we can spend all eternity with you in heaven. And it's because of his sacrifice and in his name we ask this prayer. Amen. I'm really not sure if this day could get any better. So happy for Kendall, love her so much, and for the Garner family. She comes from a great, great family. So happy for them. So happy for the men chosen to serve here. Look forward to serving with them. Summer's off to a great start. We have some things that I want to announce for you very quickly. We kicked off our summer with a lock-in Friday night, and it was a, a great turnout. I think we had pretty close to 20 there in attendance, had a lot of events, went bowling, and it was just a good time by all. Kicked off our summer, so we have several events this summer that want to make known very quickly. First of all, two mission trips this summer, two. And if you are not interested in going, can I please ask you to pray for it? The righteous prayers of individuals or the prayers of righteous individuals avails much and so if you are not going, uh, please pray for these trips to be successful for the ones who are going. The first one is Wisconsin Mission Trip. It will be July 21st through the 26th. July 21st through the 26th. And I was told that there are a few extra spots if you are interested in going and have not committed yet. Uh, that's Wisconsin. We'll make that at the end of July. And we would love... Uh, to have a few more go on that. And I was also asked if you could make a full commitment by the end of June. The second mission trip is to Scotland, the 1st of August, August 3rd through the 11th. Pray for those trips to be successful. Other events, camp, is next week, June 10th through the 15th. We have several who are here going, and uh, that's always... So much fun to go to camp. It's my first year at Camp in Agahee, so looking forward to that. And uh, good time by all. VBS, Vacation Bible School, July 8th through the 11th here uh, each night, uh, Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, July 8th through the 11th. Uh, finally, uh, there will be a bridal shower for Mallory Chapman, July 29th. Here at the building in the fellowship hall from 2.30 to 4.30, she is registered at Bed Bath & Beyond and Target. I was also given this note to pray. There was a prayer request for uh, Malin Swan. I don't have the details, just that she, they have requested prayers on Malin Swan's behalf. Other than that, I have no more announcements, more, bulletin, more events in the bulletin uh, to, con, to consider and look at those. All right, we have... One more song and a prayer. Number 663, 663. If what you see through the windows wasn't enough, how much nicer is it for the events that have taken place here this morning? Let's stand together. We'll sing the first stanza only, then we'll be dismissed in prayer. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than close in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light, oh, the sunshine. 
and blessed sunshine, while the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Let us bow and pray. Dear righteous and holy Father and God who art in heaven, it is with eternal thanksgiving, Father, that we can come unto you at this time to thank you, Father, for the sunshine that we do have in each heart. The sunshine, Father, that comes from your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the hope of eternal life that we have through the eternal sacrifice that he made, shedding his precious blood, Father, outside the city walls of Jerusalem, taking our sins there, Father, and remitting us of them when we have the opportunity to avail ourselves of that precious cleansing blood in the watery grave of baptism as Kendall has just done. Father, we pray that you will be with this young one as she goes out into life, that you will help her to read and to study and to continue to walk in the newness of life, always remembering, Father, the de desire that she has to be faithful to you. Father, we pray now that you will be with us as we depart. Please bring us back safely at the next appointed time. Bless these men, Father, that have uh, determined to be deacons. We pray that you will help them in their job to do it with love and kindness and always looking to you, Father who are the giver of all good and perfect gifts. And it's in Christ Jesus' holy and righteous name that we pray. Amen.